Sleeping, it takes one third of your life, the results of which inform the remaining two thirds of your waking hours. We know so little about it for it being such a big part of our lives, but that doesn't stop everyone from voicing their own opinion on the matter. What does science say when everyone around you is saying something different? What can you really believe? Listening to the Mind the Gap podcast, bridging the gap between your minds and everything else. I'm Keegan Gwidlin. I'm Mackie Drew. And our show today is called Catch Some Zeds. And this is obviously a show on sleep. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, we're not going to be talking about dreams, which uh, is something that, you know, we were going through setting up this show and just, you know, that's too big a topic to fit in with sleep, you know? I'll be talking a little bit about dreams. Yeah. But Just definitely not in the detail no, that no. you that we should. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, sleep was uh, we thought it would be fairly specific. It was not. Yeah, no. Um, so I'll start off with um, what sleep is in a very scientific sense. Uh, it's a naturally recurring state uh, characterized by reduced or absent consciousness and lack of most sensory and motor activity. Uh, there's obviously exceptions which we're going to talk about. Um, but, you know, you know what sleep is. It's reduced consciousness, really. Um, it occurs in mammals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Interestingly, apparently not in anything else. No, no amphibians? Uh, maybe some amphibians. Uh, insects, Se- definitely I'm not. i skip amphibians. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <there's, laughs> amphibians are probably included. I think some fish don't sleep either. I'm not oh, sure. No, though. I'm sure that they don't, yeah. I know sharks um, sleep, because I know that they swim while they sleep. Yes. Um, so, it's sort of interesting, right off the bat, like, why do certain animals have to sleep and others don't? Why do certain organisms have to sleep and others don't? Why don't bacteria? Um, but uh, sleep consists of two main types. There's REM and non-REM. Uh, and REM stands for rapid eye movement, and non-REM is obviously non-rapid eye movement. And... Um, Non-REM is divided into three stages. Uh, It was, until very recently, four stages. Uh, I won't go into the nitty-gritty neuroscience details, but basically, um, the lower the stage is, like uh, stage one is the lightest sleep and stage three is the deepest sleep. And the lower the stage, the uh, deeper the sleep and the longer the brain waves. Look on a, a measurement device called an EEG. So, the purpose of sleep is largely unknown. Um, The founder of Stanford Sleep Research Center, uh, his name is William DeMent, after 50 years of research in the field, he said that the only reason we need to sleep that is really, really solid is because we get sleepy. (laughs) So that just gives you an idea of, like, how little we really understand sleep. Yeah, you know, uh, he's such an expert. Generally, experts tend to be so very um, careful yeah, it's with true. With the claims they make. With good reason. I mean, there's tons of hypotheses, but there seems to be counterpoints to pretty much every hypothesis. So we'll go over, over like some of the main ones just very briefly. Uh, one hypothesis of sleep is restoration. Wound healing, immune function, uh, being improved, growth hormones are built and secreted during sleep, and energy is conserved. So it lowers the metabolic rate. That's one theory, but metabolic rate can, uh, the low metabolic rate can be accomplished without making an animal easily preyed upon, you know, by making it unconscious, essentially. So, I mean, that's one theory that's kind of not, you know, there's some holes in it. There's the ontogenesis hypothesis where, uh, REM is important for development of the brain. Oh, really? Wouldn't that stop, like, happening once the brain's, like, mostly developed then? Well, that's what we're thinking. I mean, 
across species, the more immature the baby at birth, the more time you spend in REM sleep. Mm. And it's um, even in humans, uh, newborns obviously need the most sleep and adults need the least sleep. So there might be something to it. I mean, uh, there's also the uh, proof that REM deprivation in early development leads to developmental abnormalities, permanent sleep disruption, behavioral issues, decreased brain mass, and high neuronal cell death. Well, um, okay, so yeah, get some sleep. <laughs> yeah, um, especially if you're a newborn. Um, there's also the memory processing hypothesis, where working memory is decreased significantly when deprived of sleep. I get um, that all the time. Yeah. Uh, the EEGs, or electroencephalograms, uh, show the brain's electrical activity while asleep, and it mirrors the electrical activity experienced while performing particular tasks while you're awake. Uh, so it's like if... I was playing ping pong and you saw the ping pong game uh, on my EEG. It's, it would look very specific. And then, you, okay. So if you were like dreaming about that, then, or? well, it's not even necessarily, we don't know that it's dreaming necessarily that like the person is reliving it, but the brain is consolidating that memory and it's doing the same electrical activity as it did when you were playing ping pong. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, that seems like a solid theory then. Um, there's also the preservation hypothesis, which states that an animal would be in danger if it were roaming around 24 hours a day. <laughs> and since it doesn't need all that time to get food and uh, meet other necessities, so it makes, it, it makes sense to put it to sleep, to put it out of danger. Uh, it doesn't, however, explain why the brain sort of disengages the world, and it would be better to stay alert in that situation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it also doesn't explain why animals at the top of food chains tend to sleep a significant portion of the day. For example, a lion sleeps up to 20 hours per day. You know, I think it does, though, because it's sort of a two-part theory. The preservation saying, oh, yeah, you don't need to expel all that work to get all that food. So, you know, well, the lion only needs to go out for four hours a day, then it, um, then it, then it's done. Then it doesn't need to waste all that extra time. But, like it said, you could achieve the uh, not wasting energy part of it by just you know resting as opposed to falling unconscious that's that's yeah okay that's fair <laughs> mm -hmm. In, interestingly uh, if since we're comparing species uh, animals that traditionally don't have a place to hide sleep less so horses cows sleep like less than five hours a day ah, see, it's uh, interesting because it's kind of like another, any other need where you you, you need sleep but we just don't understand why, you know, like desert mm -hmm. animals preserve uh, water by making more concentrated urine. And I'm sure they're doing something similar with these animals because they mm -hmm. don't have, they have a, a like a, uh, a shelter famine. Exactly. And it's like, it just doesn't make sense there. We don't have a good theory on why animals need sleep. It's probably a combination of factors. Uh, but like I said, we just don't have any really solid idea. An obvious question that comes up is what happens if you don't get enough? There was one study that we talked about in a neuroscience class I took. Uh, they put rats in a tub of water on these uh, platforms. And the platforms, the rats would, you know, uh, swim over to them, get on the platform, and they would be fine. But as soon as they lost muscle tone when they fell asleep, they would, uh, the platforms would flip over and dunk the rats in the water and wake them up again. And then they'd have to climb back on. So it was a way of keeping the rats awake indefinitely. And what they found was that after a while, these rats developed skin lesions. They had increased appetite. They experienced severe weight loss uh, and hypothermia and eventually died of sepsis. Wow, that's super weird. Why sepsis? <laughs> I have no idea. It's... They, they have no idea what's going on or what happened. You know, they find that body temperatures sometimes, like, they just go, everything seems to go crazy. Your metabolism go, goes crazy when you don't sleep. Sleep is important. Um, we've never kept a human up as long as possible because that would be unethical. Uh, some people have tried to do it and made it as long as 11 days without sleep voluntarily before passing out, basically. It's used as a torture technique, isn't it? Uh, I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Let's talk about how much sleep you need. If we know that you need it, you know, even hibernating animals, 
uh, return from hypothermia to euthermia to sleep, which is something which requires energy. It doesn't really make sense when you're hibernating. Uh, like when an animal hibernates, it lowers its body temperature to conserve energy and slow its metabolism. But even uh, animals in hibernation will uh, warm up their bodies, start using more energy to go to sleep. And then they'll return back to hypothermia. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I get the feeling we're missing something really obvious. or like everybody. I know. It, it feels like it should be right in front of us. Now, there's a lot of myths around it. It's like, can you die from not sleeping? There's no clear answer because no one's really died of just not sleeping. The rats have, though, but we don't the know for sure have. for humans. No humans. But there is a genetic prion disease called fatal familial insomnia. You can get it. Uh, you can get a non-genetic version of it, but it's far more rare. And uh, it is a mutation in a protein that um, is that has a lot of nervous system functions. And so, uh, it once you have this mutation, uh, if the disease has four stages. First, you have insomnia. Your it starts. You get panic attacks and paranoia and phobias and stuff like that for four months. Then after that, stage two is you get hallucinations, panic attacks, and uh, it gets, you know, just intensifies. And that stage lasts five months. Uh, stage three lasts three months, and it is a complete inability to sleep, followed by rapid, rapid weight loss. And uh, this is when it gets really bad before uh, stage four, which lasts about six months. And you basically lose your mind. You become unresponsive. You fall into a coma. But you're not sleeping. You're just in a coma. And then you die. Huh. Well, okay. I got a question. Yeah. You said nobody stayed a awake longer than 11 days. But th these people apparently stayed awake longer than n nine months. Uh, no one stayed awake Longer than uh, 11 days voluntarily. Ah, got it. Okay, distinctions. All right. Yes. So they've obviously got a cure for this then, right? Oh, no. It would no. be terrible if they didn't. Nope, they don't. Um, so, yeah, people die between 7 and 36 months after the onset, and it's usually due to heart failure or brain damage due to high fever and metabolism. And, in fact, when they try to treat this with sleep drugs, it makes it worse. Well, okay, so um, is that a rare disease? Uh, yeah, they actually traced it back to an Italian family in 17... I think the 1770s. Aren't you Italian? <laughs> um, only half. I see, so there's only 50% chance you have it. <laughs> yeah, that's how statistics work. Exactly, good genetics there. <laughs> All right. But yeah, one family started this thing uh, ages ago. So, um, people often will ask, uh, how long should they sleep? And really, how long you sleep is kind of meaningless. It's more about the timing of your sleep. Um, there's two markers that you have to consider. And uh, these two markers should occur after the middle of your sleep, but before you wake up. And that's the minimum core body temperature and the maximum melatonin concentration. So basically, what that means is, if you sleep for, say, eight hours, you should be asleep for at least, like, they recommend uh, you should be asleep for six hours before your body hits its lowest temperature, which occurs around 4 a.m., I believe. Hmm. And If um, you fall asleep at, like, what, 10? Well, you're kind of programmed that way through uh, light cues. I so see. your core temperature usually fluctuates similarly. Yeah, the release of melatonin uh, as a regulatory hormone is that is controlled by light dependency. It's uh, yeah, it's light yeah. dependent, right? Yes, it is. In fact, there are um, cells in your eye that are neither cones nor rods, which are the typical eye cells, and those are responsible for telling your brain whether it's light or uh, dark outside. And even blind people have these receptors and use them. Oh, so. that's cool. Seems yeah. rather cumbersome, though. I I know. Um, I feel like I could design a better human, you know? Oh, for sure. Well, at least the eye. Yeah. At the very least, the eye. <laughs> um, so 
even despite all this, um, the timing stuff, there are some recommended sleep lengths. Adults is recommended, uh, to get, uh, between seven and eight hours, um, because, and that's based on epidemiological data mostly, uh, related to mortality. So people Keegan, who, yeah. Keegan, can you explain epidemiological for the viewers? Yes. Um, basically this study did a survey of people who, and they said, um, how long did you sleep? And then they took readings of like when they died and they found that people who slept less than seven hours per night had a higher risk of death. Yeah, the distinction is an epidemiological study studies not the mechanism by how it works, but rather the uh, whether or not it does work. So mm -hmm. they, they slept more, they had a lower chance of death, they, the death they slept less. It doesn't really create a causal link, exactly. but it creates a correlative link, which is can be useful as long as you control for all the other factors involved. Yeah, which they didn't. They, uh, they said that some of these, uh, like the results may be skewed by socioeconomic differences and stuff like that. Ah, I see. Okay. So yeah, that's not a be all end all. And no. Okay. And a lot of adults report getting far less than seven to eight hours sleep a night. Um, but adults as it is need the least amount of sleep as far as humans go, where, whereas newborns need 12 to 18 hours a day, which is a lot, which, uh, speaks to that developmental, uh, hypothesis for the exactly. need for sleep. Yeah. And everyone else between newborns and adults falls somewhere in between those times. You know, I feel like when I sleep eight hours, I'm like exhausted at the end, you know, like I've overslept. Mm -hmm. Um, when I sleep like six hours or so, I, I feel like I'm, I've got a good amount. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, uh, you, you might want to consider sleep, uh, using a different sleep schedule in that case. I so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, so just to, I'll talk about sleep schedules, I guess, for a little bit. All uh, right. It's basically... A sleep schedule is a way of dividing the day into sleep and wakefulness. And there's a couple of uh, patterns that we see. The first one's called monophasic. And that's what's considered normal. It's when you sleep for, you know, like eight hours per night in a single block. Uh, you might want to consider biphasic sleep, where you sleep twice a day um, and you do a nighttime sleep that's usually less than eight hours, but it's a solid chunk. And then you do a daytime nap between 30 and 90 minutes. Who has the time? Well, <laughs> it's about the same time. Yeah, yeah, but, like, I'm not going to, like, just go to sleep in the middle of the day. Ah, oh, you don't have stuff to do, right? Uh, that's fair. <laughs> um, there's also polyphasic sleep, and this is when it gets really crazy. And this is when a person sleeps multiple times a day, between four and six times per day. And there's a couple of classifications of these. One is called the everyman sleep, which has a core sleep of less than three hours, and then you have three 20-minute naps during the day. Uh, there's one called the Uberman. That's its actual name, Uberman. <laughs> was this like a spinoff of the everyman? Uh, this was German translation, so... No, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it uses six naps, less than 30 minutes through the day, uh, with no core sleep. So it's just six naps a day. And these, these work? These keep people yeah. alert and yeah. well-rested? and Yep. Apparently no real loss of function. See, uh, I don't get that, because I can't fall asleep right away. Like, uh, it takes me yeah. half an hour to get to sleep. I don't know how they're doing that. Well, you got to train yourself. Uh, I guess it, so. You get, like, they say it takes about a week for your sleep schedule to, like... For you to not be affected by um, sleep debt and stuff like that. But the last one of these is interesting. It's called the Dymaxion. And it was apparently used by the scientist Buckminster Fuller. Uh, famous for uh, Buckminster Fullerene, which is a chemical compound. <laughs> and um, this sleep schedule consists of 30-minute naps every six hours. Um, so, so two hours four, sleep total. That's yeah, that's four a day. That seems like I something I get behind. I feel like I'm wasting so much time when I sleep. <laughs> I know, but I mean, there's also stuff like, oh, what are you gonna do when you wake up at two a.m. or whatever? Work. <laughs> yeah. 
get stuff done. I, can I guess you got to find that. a good job, a job that's flexible enough. Flexible enough, yeah. Naps instead of coffee breaks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I wanted to discuss actually um, another sort of sleep schedule, uh, what wild humans used to do. So, uh, you know, we're sort of, uh, we domesticated ourselves in a way, um, and we've trained ourselves to be on a certain sleep schedule, and the one that works great for industry. But uh, there's, um, you know, with wild humans in tribes or or in the past, we can see that they actually didn't really sleep like we do now in a monophasic, uh, monophasic was it called? Yep. A monophasic right. way? Uh, they, there's been some great research done in a, uh, a certain type of schedule in the early 1990s, the psychiatrist Thomas Weir started an experiment where he got people to be plunged into 14 hours of darkness every day for a month. So they wouldn't have any light. They wouldn't have, you know, um, they wouldn't have candles or thing or like bright lights, things like that. They would be, you know, like a normal moonlight, uh, style light and, mm they fell into a schedule of on their own. They found that they would they would not sleep for eight hours in a row. They would sleep for four hours, wake up for two, and then sleep again for four more hours. So they'd be fairly active in the two hours. They'd do things, you know, things that they wanted to get done, whatnot, eat, eat mm -hmm. stuff like that. And uh, historian Roger uh, Eckrich uh, from Virginia Tech published a seminal paper drawing from 16 years of research, which included over 500 references, uh, historical references to a two sleep cycle as well. So he's got this historical data to back up this uh, experimental data wow. that the uh, that Thomas Weir came up with. And um, the he found the historical references all the way from, you know, Homer's Odyssey to like <laughs> actual anthropological accounts. So like going to like Nigeria and checking out tribes that, that do sleep like this. Um, and kind of makes sense. It seems productive. You know, I think so too. Yeah. And I, I could totally get behind that. Um, you know, you're, you're more so like you're almost down for like 10 hours. So you mm -hmm. have the four hours and then you two hours of doing, doing some basic stuff and then you're all down again for four hours. But I think I could handle that. Uh, so the idea is that you'd, after dusk falls, you'd socialize, you'd eat, do things like that for two hours. And then you'd fall asleep for four hours. And then you would wake up for the two hours and you'd do things like have sex, eat, socialize again, read, mm. and pray. That's what they think was happening based on these historical accounts. Mm. And then you go back to sleep for four hours and then you'd wake up at dawn and then repeat. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. I think that's a kind of cool... Uh, Cool thing to think about, you know. Yeah. Uh, I guess they, people have been staying up far later since electric lights were invented. Exactly. Yeah, it's likely due to the like industrial revolution in increased need for increased efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, the in the 16th century medical manual from France, it suggested that couples trying to conceive at the optimal time would be right after the first sleep, and that's how it referred to it. No extra explanation. So people understood this then, mm -hmm. what a first sleep was and a second sleep was. Uh, and by the 17th century, um, it started to disappear. People started to become more productive and want to do more work in one day. And um, by the 1920s, it was completely gone. Nobody had any idea what it was anymore, wow. at least in Western cultures. You know, Nigerian tribes, we've found it in. But, you know, in any kind of uh, European, Western, Westernized countries, you, we don't see that at all anymore. So that might be something that we may see pop up again if, if it does so happen to be more healthy for us. That's so weird. I know, but I like it. <laughs> it's so weird that it's just vanished, vanished from the cultural memory or whatever. Yeah, and that's not probably not enough time for it to like for us to evolve past the need for that. No. So, I mean, it's probably a more like um It's a social thing. Yeah, we're doing it wrong now. Yeah. Maybe. We I mean, there's not good evidence again to suggest which one's more healthy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it'd be good to look into. Makes sense. Any, anyway, past the sleep cycle thing, I've got some quick quick myths and facts about sleep. So first off, warm milk has no effectiveness above placebo for making you tired. Ah, uh, I used to do that so that much when I was a kid. Did you really? Yeah. See, I always heard about it. I was like, oh, why would anyone do that? I'll just go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no problem going to sleep. I don't want to go to sleep. That's my problem. Like, if I'm asleep, I don't want to wake up. If I'm, if I'm awake, I don't want to go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, tr uh, people say that it's the tryptophan uh, in milk that makes you uh, sleepy. And the same thing is said for turkey, but that's actually neither have enough to make you feel sleepy. 
Hmm. Um, so, you know, when you have a big turkey dinner, it's not because you're eat, you're getting all that turkey in you that you got tired, but it's because you just ate a whole bunch of food and you're digesting. Yeah. You got to go to Rest sleep. Rest and digest. Exactly. That's exactly what's happening. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's turkey. You probably can mm. placebo yourself into being tired as well. Uh, another fun fact, people who know sign language will sign in their sleep, similar to people who speak in their sleep. Uh, That's funny. <laughs> a cool experiment in, well, cool to some, cruel to others. Uh, in 1913, scientists took spinal fluid from dogs that they kept up for several days, similar to the rat experiment, or mice, whatever it was, right. and injected into the spines of other dogs, and they went to sleep immediately. So there's some sort <laughs> of, like, bottled sleep in there. <laughs> oh, man, that's cool. Yeah, I thought so, too. Um, I I'd love more research to be done than that, but how would you get that done nowadays? Um, you could probably do that. You could do it in rats. <laughs> that's true. What do work in rats? Anyway, uh, in Pennsylvania, it's illegal to uh, sleep on top of a refrigerator outdoors, but it is legal indoors. Oh, darn. <laughs> I want to. Oh. Well, what are we going to do now for the rest of the summer? <laughs> uh, yeah, so melatonin, a common sleep aid hormone, is not a sleeping pill. And uh, Keegan, you have more information on this? Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty common myth. People are like, oh, just take melatonin. It'll put you right to sleep. But um, it's... Uh, melatonin does not act as a sleeping pill. It won't put you to sleep. Um, what it does is it opens what's called the sleep gate. And that's basically, uh, it's like your brain getting ready to sleep. So your brain has to be in a certain mood, I guess, before it'll go to sleep. And melatonin puts it in that mood. Uh, you can take melatonin and as if you, you know, continue to stay up and watch TV or be active... Uh, your brain won't go to sleep because there's other stuff happening. But if you, you know, lie quietly in the dark in your bed and you don't, and you have trouble sleeping and you take melatonin, it'll put your brain in that mood and it'll help you get to sleep. I see. Yeah. See, that's, that's not the one I was wondering because I've used melatonin in the past to get to sleep and um, mm -hmm. I'll take it. And then I'll, I knew that the fact that it doesn't put you to sleep, you're going to, you know, yeah. uh, you're going to have to work with it. But, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I still, I'd still call that a sleeping pill. Maybe I'm wrong on definitions here, but I'd still call it a sleeping pill because it makes you go to sleep. But, I mean, if you're not, why would you take a sleeping pill if you weren't planning on going to sleep right then? Well, there's lo like a lot of people say that, um, like, oh, I just, I, I never, I just can't get to sleep. Like, I feel tired, but I can't get to sleep. So melatonin is for people like that who want to sleep ah. but can't, as opposed to, you know. Uh, People in, um, people with, um, psychological diseases and disorders may get prescribed real sleeping aids to put them to sleep so that they, you know, almost force themselves into a sleep schedule. Uh, makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see the distinction, but I still think it's a little bit, a uh, little bit off. We'll just leave it at that. But, uh, yeah, I want to talk about sleepwalking on top of that, you know. Um, sleepwalking sort of, you know, infamous for, for some crazy stories associated with it. You know, people do cool things or weird things. I know um, when when I was younger, I, I remember wandering around the house, whatnot, and waking up in weird places. But, I, you know, as soon as I grew up, it stopped, mm -hmm. as it should. It's a matter of maturity. Sometimes it doesn't stop. Some, most of the time it should. Uh, but I've got three crazy stories about sleepwalking. Uh, first off, a 23-year-old Toronto man drove 10 miles and killed his mother-in-law in 1987. What? Yeah, but he was not found guilty because he was asleep and there was no apparent motive. So, well, <laughs> it was his mother-in-law. Yes. That's that's motive. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> No, but apparently they had a great relationship. Everything was great. And yeah. Um, How did he do it? Like, you know, that that was not in great detail. Uh, I looked into this, like whether or not they the couple stayed together and whatnot. But a lot of the records were for some reason sealed. And wow. I think it has to do with controversy around it. Um, mm -hmm. Because the uh, the sleepwalking defense is actually um, more commonly used than it should be. <laughs> Uh, it's it's got like you know it it works in the past and now suddenly everybody wants to use it because how can you prove if they were sleepwalking or not? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. How do, how yeah. do they prove that he was sleepwalking? 
Well, they couldn't prove that he wasn't. <laughs> Sadly, that's how courtrooms often work. <laughs> uh, Reasonable doubt, right? I suppose so. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, um, Lee, Lee Hadwin is a nurse, and he claims to be a sleepwalking artist. So when he falls asleep, he wakes up with charcoal drawings. <laughs> But the thing is, I looked at some of the drawings, and they're not very good. <laughs> they're really not. They're 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 amateur at best. But uh, they're not like awful. They're not stick figures. I guess um, he had to <laughs> add a little bit of edge. He's like, well, I did do these while I was asleep. Yeah, yeah. He show everybody. He's like, these suck. And he's like, oh, but I was asleep. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I buy it or not. Because, but uh, he says he has no interest or ability when he's awake. Um, well, he's right about ability. <laughs> Oh, uh, maybe we're two harsh critics. Yes, um, true. Yeah, there's a 59 year old chef who has been sleepwalking for 44 years, not as a child apparently, which is very uncommon. Uh, mm -hmm. And five times a week, he will wake up, cook food, and uh, then go back to sleep, uh, or rather, back to bed. I guess he's never woke up. He'll make omelets, stir fries, and French fries most often. Wow! But he wants That's that great. treat. He's gone to specialists to try to get it fixed because he doesn't want to kill himself, you know? I guess. <laughs> With but... boiling oil and knives and stuff. Come on. <laughs> but cooking, he's cooking. <laughs> Thing is, he's got an intestinal disorder and he can only have small amounts of food at a time. And he thinks that his him sleepwalking is him trying to satiate his desire for big meals. Mm. So uh, that's his thought on it. That's not necessarily like his doctor's thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, those are some fun sleepwalking stories. On but yeah, um, have you heard of lucid dreaming? Uh, I think I have. It's when you realize that you're asleep and you're dreaming, and then you can control yourself or something. Exactly. It, it's actually just the idea that you can uh, you know you're dreaming. Uh, the it's often associated with controlling the dream as well, but not necessarily for lucid dreaming. Uh, and it's historically been seen all over the place. Aristotle observed. Um, Often when one is asleep, there is something in consciousness which declares that when present, itself is but a dream. So hmm. he knew about it. Um, but there's, a, you know, something I didn't realize is there's a lot of skepticism about it. And it actually makes a lot of sense. And I kind of like this. Um, Dr. Uh, Patrick McN McNamara of Boston University has his doubts about lucid dreaming. Um he says there's not really a great way to know when somebody is dreaming. Like you said, the EEG actually shows up kind of like it's uh, somebody's awake if they're in REM sleep. Yeah. So you can only lucid dream if you are in REM sleep. Yep. And dreaming occurs in REM sleep. Exactly. So you can't really, there's not really a really great way to determine whether or not somebody's dreaming. So there's not really a great way to study it. Yeah. The only way is to take their word for it. Exactly. So the late Mal uh, Norman Malcolm, uh, he's a philosopher who died in 1990 at the age of 79, said, I dreamt, or said that this is something that could mean, or that could explain lucid dreaming without the idea of you actually controlling your dreams. Uh, I dreamt that I realized I was dreaming, I dreamt that I was affected, uh, affecting the course of my dream, and then I dreamt that I woke myself up by telling myself to wake up. So how can you know whether or not you were just dreaming you were doing these things or whether yeah. you were actually doing them? Yeah. That's and that, that's a great epistemological point, and I completely love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like asking, how do we know we're not in the Matrix? And the best answer is we don't. And that's the same yep, thing here. So, true. I mean, we can't know whether lucid dreaming is actually a thing. Because, I mean, I'll believe in, in my dreams when I'm dreaming, I, I think I'm coming up with the greatest ideas ever. And I'll wake up and I'll think about it, and I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I ever came up with. But I'll, at the yeah. time, I'll think I just... I, I was coming up with these great thoughts. and Well, well, Mackie, I think you're missing one thing. There is a way to determine if you're dreaming or not. Oh. And that's to use your totem, right? Your t totem? Have you seen Inception? No. Are you serious? Oh. Sorry, well, I, in Inception, they're able to determine whether I, or not they're... I, didn't, I know. I, know I, I got that, actually. I, I do know... Um... I do know of that movie. I didn't know that was the name of the thing with the uh, spinny top or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, no, uh, there, there was apparently a way in lucid dreaming to look, just to know if you're dreaming. Um, well, it, people it's say like, it's stuff like look at a thing and then look away and look back at it. And if it's the same words, then you're exactly. not dreaming. But how do you or... know if you're not just dreaming that? I know. <laughs> But yeah, Stephen Labar uh, Laberge, a, a psychophysiologist suggests that it might be a brief period of wakefulness. So, so you know, you're, you are gaining a, Yep. A little bit of control. And yep. I totally get that because I can sort of influence a dream if I, like, wake up, think about what what's going to happen next. Like, mm -hmm. I'm remembering my dream. Like, I'm actually awoken. 
Yep. And then I go back to sleep later, and I'm like, oh, and now it's different. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I could totally get that. Um, but again, it's too hard to study. So we, we don't know much about it. We can't know much about it is, is the end goal. <laughs> well, we end. have to we have to figure out sleep first, and then we can talk about <laughs> we can, dreams, We can I work think. on that, yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, there's actually a cool app that's developed for the iPhone to study lucid dreaming and dreaming in general. Um, it was created by Professor Richard Wiseman. He's a psychologist. Oh, and, he's uh, great. <laughs> The idea is that he uh, he's trying to build a database of how external audio can influence dreams. So basically, you put this the phone on your bed, and it tracks your movements. So once you're like perfectly still, it can tell you're in a deep sleep, or REM sleep. That's what at least he purports, and um, then it will start to play certain audio and try to influence your dreams. Hmm. So he's trying to build a database of what certain things trigger certain other things. And uh, <laughs> some weird stuff on it, though, you know, like uh, tagging your friends. So the idea is you wake <laughs> up, you wake up and you tell like you basically tell the database about what your dream was about. Mm-hmm. And then you, you're you you're able to hook it into Facebook and tag which friends were in your dreams. That's that would be awkward sometimes. That's I think Super stupid. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I might no, try I it know. once <laughs> <laughs> just to see how awkward it gets. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, apparently uh, Richard Wiseman um, is like obsessed with like reading about other people's dreams and stuff. It's all anonymous, so it doesn't really matter. But I kind of think that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so that's a cool app called Dream On. It's for yeah. the iPhone only, sadly. I actually um, got a I got a an app just today. That's a, a it's a like an alarm clock app, but it reads your sleep cycles. And yeah, it, yeah. Like, Dream, on, Dream on also does that. Once it, once you're in a like a like a like less deep state of sleep, it tries to wake yeah. you up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's an interesting kind of alarm clock. Um, yeah, and it does the same thing by like you put it on the bed and it registers your movements and tracks your sleep cycles. Yeah, yeah. The Dream on can uh, function by also, I believe, uh, video. Oh, really? So you put it up to your bed. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Um, it doesn't wouldn't work. Uh, video would only or would be a better alternative. For instance, if you're sleeping with a partner, then you wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a confounding exactly. data. Exactly, but there's some co- co- other cool alarm clocks I uh, found out about while researching the show. Um, the blimp alarm clock. <laughs> so basically, um, the it's on a docking bay, and when it's time to wake up, it starts making like it start it flies away, <laughs> and it starts to make loud beeping noises. Um, so you have to catch the alarm clock. <laughs> so it'll try to fly away from you, get high up. You got to deal with that every morning. Same thing about a helicopter. You know, the helicopter flies away and tries to stay away from you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a rolling alarm clock, rolls off the bed, so it gets away from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there's a um, spinning alarm clock. And I know that sounds similar to a rolling alarm clock, but it's not. It's um, something you actually, to turn it off, you actually have to, it's on like a, a string, and you basically have to swing it around your head for 90 <laughs> seconds to stay active, to wake wow. you up, to turn it off, which is kind of clever. <laughs> yeah. I feel like people uh, would find a... cheats for that, you know? Yeah, they, they I know. I, somehow, well, I, like... I certainly would. <laughs> I hate <laughs> Uh, there's a math question alarm app, so you have to answer like ten old math questions till you until it turns off. Mm. Um, there's mm-hmm. some some uh, like basic natural alarm clocks, right? There's the rooster call that was like the first kind of after we figured out agriculture that once the rooster calls in the morning, then you wake up. We we initially were waking up. I, to the I sun. was wondering if that one was legitimate, the rooster one. Well, it's it's not necessarily legitimate. Some roosters do do it, some do not. So it, it matters on what farm you're on and what, I mean, it, it mostly they're just cawing when the sun comes up, right? So you're you're yeah. better off just waking yeah. up with the sun anyway. Uh, you, you're a circadian rhythm, so you can just, you know, wake up. Like, you'll often find you wake up like a minute before your alarm goes off and you're like, how'd that happen? Mm-hmm. It's because you're in a proper sleep cycle, right? Yeah. And Fair. you're, you're uh, waking up beforehand. Uh, and a, another way, another historical way to wake up was drinking lots of water so that you'll have to uh, pee soon and that'll yeah. wake you up. I've, I've heard of that one. <laughs> uh, the, what I heard, and I can't remember the source and I haven't looked into it, so this could be wrong, but I've heard that, um, before a battle, 
uh, like a tribe oh, or whatever yeah. would drink a lot of water so they could get up earlier and, you know, start the assault before the other people woke up. You think you just keep one guy up to wake everybody I know, else up? I know. <laughs> it's more reliable. I mean, maybe he'd fall asleep. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, the, a few more. Uh, the step up alarm clock, you have to step on it to turn it off. So you have to actually stand up before you can mm. turn it off. Um, there's a donation alarm clock. So it's connected to your bank account and uh, your favorite charity. And uh, <laughs> every time you want to press the snooze button, you have it, it, you have it, it charges you. So you set the amount of charge ah. an amount it charges you beforehand, and then you press the snooze button, and it'll donate. So you you can't keep pressing snooze, otherwise you'll be broke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's uh, fun the, actually. Similar to the step up alarm clock, there's a wait alarm clock where not only do you have to step on it, but it'll tell you your weight in the morning as well for those who want to lose weight. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. And there's a finally a sort of the counterweight alarm clock, the <laughs> bacon alarm clock. <laughs> so this one, um, it's basically a big wooden box. It's got a little heater in it, and you put bacon in there the night before, already cooked. And uh, when it it wakes you up by a uh, first off outputting the bacon on a tray, <laughs> and it heats smell. it up stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, it keeps it warm. Yeah. And then the smell should wake you up. And if it doesn't, then then it'll go to the secondary noise alarm. But then you have great bacon to wake up to. So that's fun. <laughs> and who wouldn't love that? Ah, I guess vegetarians. vegetarians. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, move on to the game segment then? Yep. Welcome to our game segment. So, uh, Keegan, mm -hmm. have you ever had a false awakening? Do you know what that is? I don't think I do. All right. So a false awakening is the classic, you wake up, but you're still in a dream. So you think you've uh -huh. woken up, you may be doing your normal day things, and then you wake up and then you're like, well, here I am. <laughs> and then you can wake up again. I don't think I, I can't remember ever having one. See, I haven't remembered my dreams for a long time. Ah, that means you have no soul. <laughs> ah, well, I only suspected. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I actually, I I remember one fairly vividly. I, I think I was in grade six. I remember this because I was so shocked. And I got like halfway through the day before I woke up again. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, I got to do I, all this all over again. Yeah. It was like the most defeating thing in the world, <laughs> you know, because I remember it being a particularly crappy day mm. and, uh, I woke up and I dealt with it and then I woke up again and I dealt with it again and it's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that that doesn't happen too often. But that's yeah. called a false awakening for anybody who cares. <laughs> that's fun. You know what I do get is I get that um, as you're falling asleep. I think it's called a myoclonic jerk. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've got those too. Uh, where it's when you're falling asleep and then you'll like jerk yourself awake. And mm -hmm. it's like that sudden feeling of falling and you like... Uh, you sort of like react to try to um, stop yourself from falling type thing. Um, but it's your brain thinking that like your body is dying or something like that and trying to make you move. So it's sort of a little brain trick, but um, I do. I get that all the time too, but only when I'm trying like not to fall asleep. So like, <laughs> like if I'm like, uh, like well, really, good, really then. tired. That's good then. It's oh, waking is it? you up. Well, oh, yeah, it's waking you so. up, right? So. Yeah, yeah, I think it's all the guilt. Okay. Um <laughs> All right. So, uh last week um on the for the 5-minute challenge, which uh has us each week challenge each other to uh one topic that we get to the other researches and then reports back after f only 5 minutes of research. So last week I challenged Keegan to learn as much about as po uh, tiny towns as possible in five minutes so keegan what did you find well first off i i knew that i knew what this was i did my research on um july 24th between 3 35 and 3 40 p.m and um i knew what you meant 
right off the bat because you said the not offensive term is tiny towns. Mm-hmm. And I had seen an episode of An Idiot Abroad, which uh, uh, where, where uh, Carl Pilkington, the star of the show, goes to a uh, basically like a dwarf colony in China. And he's talking about how great it is. He thinks it's like hilarious. And then he talks on the phone with Ricky Gervais and Ricky's like, it's not supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be like, look at how these people are treated. They're treated like a freak show. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's hilarious. They love it. They're in costumes. It's oh, like, yeah, God. it's a freak oh. show. Yeah. So that's the, um, yeah, that's the kingdom of the little people. Yeah. Which has, um, that's where um, the Chinese government puts little people to work. Mm-hmm. as be- being an attraction to tourists yes. and they dress up in like fairy costumes and and, uh, yeah. and there was like a guy dressed up as a king and there were like guys in armor as like oh, guards and stuff it's a terrible <laughs> yeah no, no doubt there's controversy yeah. but yeah so, <laughs> so uh, i knew learn? what i was looking for but it was really hard to find under the name tiny towns i came across like a place called oh tiny township that's a place called Tiny Township. All sorts of, like, very small villages and stuff. It's like, this is not what I need. I even found, like, a mini, like, a one-sixth scale model of normal places, of, like, a, a standard town, and it was like, nope, this is this is the Tiny Town version of this town. Oh, like, oh. that sucks. I, I thought it would be easier. But finally, I finally came across it. Basically, they're all just sort of like that one that uh, we just talked about, where it's communities of... Uh, dwarves of various, uh, like various types of dwarves, and they live in proportionally sized houses. And there's a lot of like, uh, it's a tourist attraction in a lot of places. Uh, well, you know, the only one I know of is the uh, Kunming China. The rest are hoaxes or myths or legends. Yes, uh, there's been a couple of them. Like, a, there's one that I that caught my eye just briefly. Um, because I live, uh, I'm from Milton, uh, Ontario is my hometown, and right beside us is Mississauga, and there was reportedly one in Mississauga, but it turned out to be a hoax. Yes, like well, it was not not a hoax, but it was um, it was actually supposed to be um, for immigrants. They were just smaller houses because <laughs> yeah. they were immigrants, <laughs> and uh, they, yeah, they were for a uh, Slovakian uh, immigrants, and mm-hmm. uh, they just so happened to uh, be abandoned, and everybody saw these tiny little like houses and tiny little playground and they assumed it was only seven or eight houses but they assumed it was a tiny little uh and that's what i've found is that uh, most of them are not very expansive it's mostly like you know eight to ten houses and that's it yeah generally there's uh, a couple myths there's one uh supposed to be in fairfax uh fairfax county in virginia uh, the Jefferson Township in New Jersey and uh, Long Beach, California, and again, uh, Mississauga, Ontario. Uh, but all of them do happen to be just misunderstandings. Somebody made a small house, for instance, and it was just small and everybody assumed. There's actually a legend in Long Beach, California that the, uh, uh, what is it, the Munchkins yeah, from the Wizard of Oz, oh, they yeah. became so successful from the movie that they started their own little village and um called uh known as midget town and that is simply not true the midget town that it's purported to be was actually built before the movie came out so um simply false uh but fun to think about there's a lot of munchkin myths i find yeah or like the one about the suicide <laughs> i don't know that one. Oh, you've not heard that one no okay uh yeah the idea is uh if you look closely in the background of one of the scenes of um the uh, Wizard of Oz, you can see a what looks like a uh, a munchkin, mm-hmm. uh, being or like on a noose, like hanging in the background. Oh, I have I've seen a picture of that. Yeah, the HD version came out, and it turns out it was a bird. Really? So, yeah, I saw the one I saw was a picture of like the main four people, the like Dorothy and the three yeah people, and then in the background there it looked like three munchkins or well look like three people hanging from a branch no no i think you're mistaken sorry no it's uh there was usually one hanging from the branch and then they came with the hd version and it turned out that it was a uh, like a large weird like ostrich-like bird that was just chilling 
Hmm. But uh, I can show you later. I, I yeah. assure you. <laughs> sure. But um, yeah, that's basically all the interesting stuff there are on um, Tiny Towns or the more offensive Midgetville. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, now it's my turn to challenge you. I'm so excited. And I went with something a little bit medical this time. Okay. Uh, the, what I want you to look up is hypercapnia. Okay, I can do that. So that's H-Y-P-E-R-C-A-P-N-I-A. All right, well, then I'll tell you about it next week. Excellent. I look forward to it. And now I have a quiz for you. All right, cool. And this one was a little bit difficult, but I think it turned out pretty good. It's mm -hmm. called Dreaming of Electric Sheep. All right. And so the interpretation of dreams has been a common practice for thousands of years because people have thought in the past and continue to think that dreaming is a means of supernatural communication or seeing the future or something like that. This is obviously totally woo, but it's still fun to talk about. So in this quiz, I'll list a dream interpretation and I'll give you a symbol that it may correspond to. And you have to tell me whether the interpretation corresponds to the symbol I gave you or to another symbol. And if it's to another symbol, what symbol is it? Do I just come up with a symbol? Yeah. But to make it easier, the proposed symbol and the true symbol will share the first few letters. All right. So okay. It'll be close. Okay. Kind of complicated. Let's do this. Yeah. So, uh, number one, seeing this symbol in your dream signifies your desire for adventure, freedom, and exploration. Is the symbol you saw a saint? A saint? Like a Catholic saint? Yes. A Saiyan. No, um, let's see. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it is. Do I have to get the other symbol? Uh, part marks. I don't know. I don't know. What is it? It's a sailor. Sailor. Ah. S-A-I. Yeah, I couldn't come up with any S-A-I words. I'm not a good scrabbler. So, uh, saint, if you see a saint, it actually means that a special message is being given to you from the spiritual realm. Uh, number two, seeing this symbol can indicate longevity, nourishment, and abundance, or alternatively, that you're in a messy relationship. Is this symbol spaghetti? Longevity. I guess it's long. It's messy. Gets tangled up. Man, uh, the spaghetti is so specific. If you did come up with this one, then I think you've done a good job, but I think it is spaghetti. It is, in fact, spaghetti. Nice. Okay, good stuff. So you didn't do a good job. <laughs> Uh, I, it makes me wonder, like, who makes these, like, who decided that that's what that means? Uh, number three, seeing this symbol means you need to relax and rest. However, it may also mean that you're oblivious to something that's happening right in front of you. Is the symbol a paintbrush? I think it's probably, I see, I don't know any other P-A-I words other than pain. Try just P A. P-A-O, okay. So it is definitely not that then. So thank you for that clue, sir. <laughs> well, you had it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This is so vague and large. How am I supposed to get that? Tell me what it is. <laughs> Pajamas. Pajamas? Mm -hmm. How does that have anything with sight? What? You're missing something in front of you. You're oblivious to stuff that's happening in front of you because you're asleep. Brilliant. All right. All right. <laughs> Paintbrushes symbolize harmony and creativity. Okay, fine. I'm terrible <laughs> at this. Sue me. Uh, seeing this symbol suggests that you need to rid yourself of negative energy. Is the symbol you saw a gallows? No, I don't think it is. Okay. Uh, I think it's um something else that starts with a G A. <laughs> Try G-A-L-L. -L. Really? Mm. Gallbladder? It is gallbladder. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> yep, I will give that one to you. <laughs> it is a gallbladder. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I guess that makes sense. I just didn't think, like, what? <laughs> so who, specific. Who dreams of a gallbladder? Yeah, who's thinking that? When did that come up? I don't know. All but right. uh, gallows actually indicates that you're feeling threatened. Hmm. Okay. Uh, seeing this symbol means that you're having issues communicating your thoughts and that you're holding back negative emotions. Is the symbol gum, as in chewing gum? Yeah, I think that is true, because you'd gum up your mouth. Okay. You are incorrect. Ah, uh, what was it? 
It is gums. As gums? In, yes. Your gums that your teeth are stuck into. Oh, that's cheating. That's the same <laughs> thing. Gum means that you're unable to express yourself and that you've invo- you're involved in a sticky situation. Same thing. Come on. <laughs> they were close. They were really close. <laughs> Seeing this symbol means that there is an ever-present evil force working against you. Is the symbol a volcano? I'm thinking, like, if I can come up with some words that also start with, like, a V-O-L and they make more sense, then I'll go with it. But I think if, like, my default is volcano, obviously. Um, I don't think there's many V-O or V-O-L words. Vaccine? Voxine? It's hilarious. You'll laugh when I tell you what it is. Uh, so it's not volcano. Okay, all right. What is it? It is Voldemort. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's Voldemort. <laughs> if you dream about Voldemort, <laughs> there's an ever-present evil for- force working against you. I didn't think that'd be even an option. Right? <laughs> I, th- I thought this would be based on some ancient wisdom, you know, like not <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> uh, a volcano means that you're unable to control your emotions, which makes sense, I guess. Uh, I guess I'll give you one point for that one. Sure. Uh, seeing this symbol means you've turned... Uh, you're, you're tuned into your spirituality, intuition, and awareness. Are you dreaming about a whale? Now, if it was a dolphin, I could bet. Well, uh, is it phonetically or is it by spelling that it would be a different one? Uh, by spelling. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, whale, wah, where, wah. <laughs> Wow, it's a whale. It's got to be. It is a whale. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, get one I don't know why. I don't know why. And uh, last one. If you dream of this, it means you have to break down the walls around you. Are you dreaming about sleep? Breaking down the walls around you. I think it would be a sledgehammer. It is, in fact, a sledgehammer. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> All right, look at I'm getting good. All right, yeah, sh- sleep give me ten means more. Uh, peace of mind or ignorance, and that's that's my quiz this week. So I guess I might as well uh, close it up here. Yeah. Uh, so that's our show for this week. Uh, email your comments and questions to mindthegaphosts at gmail dot com. Our next show will be called I can't believe it's not natural. Subscribe to us on YouTube, iTunes, or the podcast feed of your choice, and rate or like us depending on your platform. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'm Keegan Goodlin. I'm Mackie Drew. See ya. In the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight.